Morning. How's the family this morning? We want to thank the band, man. They brought some emotion this morning, did such a great job. Thank you guys, all you guys, for what you do. Well, happy Father's Day to all you dads. And uh, I guess that most times on Father's Day, at most churches, uh, you have a standard Father's Day sermon you do and uh, or that you bring, and it kind of ties into the same thing, and that's not me. I, I'm not too good at that kind of stuff, so we're going to venture a little off path. I am going to mention that, uh, Nick, the song that you sang there at the last, it talked about baseball and the whole deal, how God lines that up. You and I didn't have any clue that I was going to have a home plate here today, so... Uh, you know, God just lines it up, doesn't he? That's right. A little boy was asked what the difference between Father's Day and Mother's Day was. He said, they're about the same, except you don't have to spend as much money on Father's Day. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I have a question for you here today. Do you care enough, and I'm speaking to fathers, moms, we're not going to leave you out, you should be part of this, but... The fathers and dads here, do you care enough about your children to correct them? I guess that just depends on how you look at correction more than anything else. The correction we're talking about is making children aware of their mistakes and showing them the right way to handle mistakes and to prevent mistakes in the future. Dads, when you care, you will correct. Amen? Proverbs 3, uh, verse 11. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline, and do not resent his rebuke, because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father, the son he delights in. Amen. You know, if we sometimes fail to correct our children, or we fail to offer discipline for our children, then in some essence of that, it truly shows we really do not care enough about the future of our children. And trying to motivate our sons and daughters to pursue a path of godliness, that isn't easy. That isn't easy. They don't always want what we want. They don't always want to follow the path that we're on. So it makes it a little, bit more, a little bit more difficult for us as fathers. It takes courage, though. It takes courage for dads to stay the course and stand our ground without losing heart and giving up on your children. It takes courage. It takes strength. And it takes the will of God to help you to lead your family and your children in the right direction. I've heard dads and moms both say, and I've heard this said over and over again, when you ask someone, well, why doesn't your children come to church with you? One of the most common responses I get is, well, I don't want to put up with the hassle of trying to get them here. I don't want to fight with them to get them dressed, or they don't want to come, and it's not worth the hassle to do that. Well, I'm old school. And I'd say, who's the dad? Who's the father? Who's the leader? Who's the leader of your household? Ephesians 6, chapter 6, verse 4 says, Fathers, do not provoke your children. Instead, bring them up in training and instruction of the Lord. Rather, we've got to figure out how not to fight with them, how to provoke them to a fight, but encourage them. Encourage them. I'm not saying just sugarcoat it. I'm saying encourage them. And we do that by example. Amen? Dads, you need the love and the power of the Holy Spirit in your hearts to be successful in any correction that you try to do in your household especially with your children. The best way to provide loving correction to your children is to do so when our own spirit 
is under the Holy Spirit. When our own spirit is under the Holy Spirit, when we as dads, and I see this over and over again, when we as dads lose control, then our correction to instruct comes across in the wrong way. Lead by example. If you're out of control, how can you expect your kids to be in control? And the only way you can control yourself or have self-control is through the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ. Amen? There's a correct way and a wrong way. There's a foolish way. And then there's God's way. We as fathers care enough, we correct. And when we care, we lead. Proverbs 22, verse 6. I like the King James Version. Train up your child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. One thing we as fathers should never do, never do, is change the rules because our children don't like the rules. Never do. Many times in the, today's world, every child has to be a winner. They have to win every time. They have to get a prize every time. And if not, we change the rules to fit the child. Amen? You see it in society today. Some of you sitting here today may not agree. You know, just, cause, just because one team wins don't mean the other team gets a trophy too. If they don't learn how to lose in society, they will never know how to function in society. I believe this is why our young people of today can't function at home, in school, in the workplace, or in today's society. Many believe, and our, our, I'm speaking of our younger generation, not beating you up, guys, but many believe they are entitled for things to go their way. They're entitled that they're owed it. That it shouldn't be any other way. There should be no correction. There should be no discipline. Everything should just be peachy and cream all the time. The perfect world. There's only one perfect world, and that's in heaven. Amen? I would like to share a visual with, for you this morning. This is a, not a visual of something I came up with but was brought to a group of 4,000 baseball coaches in Nashville, Tennessee in 1996. This visual was presented by John Scalinas, and at the time, John was 78 years old and retired from coaching a career that began in 1948. I guess we can say John saw a few things in his time. We can safely say he had an old school way of seeing things a down-to-earth way of seeing things, a correct way of seeing things. He used a brand-new home plate, just like this, when he came in to speak to all these coaches, and this was his visual. And I think it is appropriate today, I'm going to do the best I can to carry us through with what he mentioned, what he brought to these coaches. This is, like I say, this is not something I came up with, but it's such a great visual I think you'll be able to follow me with that. His first question to the group, and my question to you is, how wide is home plate in Little League? How wide is home plate in Little League ball? Anybody know? Everybody afraid to answer? What? 13 inches. No, but you're close. Anybody know? You know because you read. 17 inches. 17 inches in Little League ball. Okay, how about when Babe Ruth played ball? Anybody know what size the home plate was when Babe Ruth played? 17 inches. There you go. You got that right. How wide is home plate in high school baseball, Wayne? 17 inches, exactly. Now we're going to step up a little bit. How wide is home plate in college baseball? 17 inches. There you go. You're getting it right now. We're on a roll here. Now let's see if you can answer this. How wide is home plate in minor league and major league baseball? There you go.
there you go. You're all getting it now. It's 17 inches also. From, from Little League through Bay Ruth's area, era, through high school, college, majors, everything. It's 17 inches. It never changed. Amen? So you, so you get where I'm going there. So what do, and this is one of his questions, what do major league coaches do with a major league pitcher who can't throw a ball over a 17-inch home plate? I changed around a little bit what he said so we can understand it because I did a little research on that. If he can't do that, they send him back to the minor league first and try to, for him to improve. And if he doesn't, then they either trade him or they release him from the team. Rather, if he can't do it, that's what they have to do. What they don't say, what they don't say, that's okay. Since you can't hit a 17-inch target, we'll make it 18 inches. We'll make it 19 inches. What if we make it 20 inches so you can have a better chance of throwing across the plate? He then asks, what do coaches do when our best player shows up late for practice? Or when our team rules forbid facial hair and a player shows up unshaven? How about if he gets caught drinking or arrested, what do we do? Do we hold them accountable or do we change the rules to fit them? Do we widen home plate? That was his question. Do we widen home plate? And then he did, did and said this. Let's see if I can turn this around. I'm not an artist, so I'm going to do the best I can with this. Be easier turning on here. Do not laugh at my drawing. (laughs) It's the best I can do. This is the problem in our homes today. That's what he said. This is the problem that we just talked about in our homes today with our marriages, with the way we parent our kids, with our discipline. We don't teach accountability to our kids, and there are no consequences for failing to meet standards. This is what happens in our homes today. We widen home plate to fit the child. Then he did this. can't see that, he drew an American flag on, on the plate above the door. This is the problem in our schools today. The quality of our education for our youth is going downhill fast, and teachers have been stripped of the tools they need to be successful and to educate and discipline our young children. We're allowing others to widen home plate. Once again, he drew on this. And he turned it back. And he says, this is the problem in our church. After he drew the cross on there and he said, powerful people in positions of authority, have taken advantage of our young children, only to have such things swept under the rug for years and years. Some church leaders are widening home plate for themselves, and we allow it. We allow it. The same is true for our government. Our so-called representatives make rules for us that don't apply to themselves. 
They take bribes from many different sources. They no longer serve us. And we allow them to widen the home plate and we are seeing our country falling into an abyss of darkness. John had presented a visual and a speech that impacted almost every individual that was there that day. He actually got them thinking about where they were failing these young players, these young men. He made them realize as leaders, fathers, and the people that are instructing these kids how they're failing them by allowing things to go on, by turning their head and acting like it didn't happen and not holding them accountable and not offering the discipline for them to learn from their mistakes. We as fathers and leaders of our households, we need to identify these areas of our own weaknesses and our own responsibilities that we're failing in today. You know, I'm not here this morning to beat you up, dads, but I know there's many of us that get into those areas where we don't want the hassle. Where we don't want the hassle of trying to correct a child when that's exactly what God calls on us to do. Lead, instruct, and guide, but in a godly way. We need to hold ourselves accountable. In all these areas we're failing at. We should not allow our families, our faith, and our society to continue down undesirable paths that we can start to change with us. As fathers, if we fail to hold ourselves to a higher standard and a standard of what we know to be right, if we fail to hold our spouses and our children to the same standards, if we're unwilling or unable to provide a consequence when they do not meet the standard, and if our schools, churches, and government fail to hold themselves accountable to those they serve, there is only one thing. There is only one thing that we can look forward to, and he did this right here. Darkness. A world of darkness is where we're headed. Dads, fathers, husbands, it's up to us. God calls us the spiritual leaders of our, house, our household. You know, I may be come here and be the pastor here at this church, but I'm also the pastor at my home. And you should be too. You're no different. It's up to you to set the standard. It's up to you to offer the discipline and the correction. It's up to you to offer the teaching. Don't say, well, go see mom. Mom will do it. It's up to you to offer the teaching and the guidance that young children need in their lives today. As fathers, as dads, we have a huge responsibility. And we need to step up and take that responsibility back in control, which has failed and fell off in the many years that we've seen. It's time for us to make the change. I always say we may not be able to change the world, but we can change our part of it. Amen? The people we come in contact with. Fathers, stop widening the plate. Lead by example. Using God and His Word as your most powerful asset you could ever have. I would like to share with you five things that we as fathers should be doing for our children. Five things, five simple things that are very, very important. Fathers should reveal a good life. Live our lives like a letter from God for our children to read. 2 Corinthians, if you turn with me there, we're going to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning at verse 2. Second Corinthians chapter three, beginning at verse two. It says, You yourselves are our letter, written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. You show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Amen. Second. Fathers should issue discipline when needed. B, 
be fair and consistent with love and discipline. Proverbs 13, chapter 13, verse 24. Proverbs 13, verse 24. Whoever spares the rod hates their children, but the one who loves their children is careful to discipline them. Number three, fathers should lead by example. Be like Christ in all you do. James uh, chapter 1, beginning at verse 22. James chapter 1, beginning at verse 22. Do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourself. Do what it says. It didn't say, I suggest. It didn't say, maybe. It said, do what it says. Sometimes we take the words in the Bible, and we want to twist them. We want to widen the plate of the Bible to fit what we want it to say. That doesn't work. You cannot twist the words of the Bible and be right. Number four. Fathers should never give up on their children. A good example, the story of the lost son in the book of Luke, is a good example of not giving up on your children. We understand the parable of the lost son or the prodigal son. How the father, he wanted to take his inheritance and leave, and the father let him go. And he hit rock bottom not shortly after that. And he came back home. And he repented for what he had done. And his father forgave him. That's where we need to be with our children. Because that's where Jesus Christ is with us. Every day. And this is the most important thing a father can do for his children. If you don't do anything else that I just suggested, this is the most important. Fathers should pray for and with their children. To reveal a heart of love and caring for your children through prayer. You should pray for and with your children. James chapter 5, beginning at verse 16. James chapter 5, beginning at verse 16 says, The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. You know, I think sometimes that's where we struggle. It's not comfortable for us. It's not comfortable for us to pray with our wives, much less our children. It's not comfortable for dads to go look their son in the eye and say, I love you. We fail at that. I failed at that with our son early on. My wife told me one time, hey, we were fixing to drop our son off in Colorado Springs at 16 years old and leave him with a host family. And she told me, you need to tell him you love him. I said, no, he don't need that. And he felt the same way. He didn't need to tell that to me. We don't need that. We know we love one another. We don't need to share that. We don't need to say that. I think we were afraid of each other. Instead of being how father and son should be, we were a little distant there. And he's fixing to be a long distance from me. So we were a little afraid of that. But you know, the day that we dropped him off, And I found the courage to hug him and say, I love you. He looked right at me and he said, I love you too. That's what it takes. That's why we need to pray with our kids. That's why we need to talk with our kids. They need to hear it from us. 
just like we hear it straight from God's Word. Amen? Don't sugarcoat it. Don't widen the plate to make it all better. Have a standard. Be reasonable, Bill. Be reasonable in all your discipline. Be consistent. If you're going to correct children for something, be consistent. Don't let one thing slide just because you let it slide. Be consistent. Children need consistency, and they need leadership, and they need love from you, just like we need that from God above. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we come to you this morning, and Father, we just are so thankful. We're thankful, Father, for just everything you do for us, everything that you're placed in our lives. And Father, we thank you that they are dads. We thank you for the children, which are a gift to us. And Father, this morning I pray that we consider that as a gift, that each and every child was presented to us in that way, and that we take care of that gift. And Father, that we teach, we instruct, and we correct, and we discipline, and we guide our children. And Father, most of all, that we raise them. And we raise them in the way of the Lord, Father. As you say, if we do this, they may depart from it, but they will return. Father, today, as we struggle in today's society on what's right and what's wrong, we pray for all the fathers here on the decisions they have to make on a day-to-day basis. I pray for strength that you would provide each and every one of them with the strength and the courage and the responsibility to do what it is you would have them do in raising their children. Father, we just thank you so much that you loved us enough to show us that grace and mercy. And I pray that we treat each and every one of our children the same way, that we lead our households as fathers should, and that we step up and take the challenge and not duck the responsibility. Father, we thank you for your presence here today. Father, we just thank you for all the good things that you've got going on here. And Father, we thank you for the struggles that are making us stronger. I thank you for this large family that you have presented here. And Father, I pray that we continue to be that one type family that we need to be. Father, we love you, we praise you, and I pray today that everything we said, everything we did, was pleasing, glorifying, and uplifting to you. And we ask this in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen.